Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to begin a new study, but to do so, we're going to do a review of, um, of the lines. And uh, so some people are familiar with this, but this was where we had finished off when we did the Book of Judges back to 2023. I guess it was in August that we began the study of looking at, at Daniel's last vision. And then, so Daniel chapter 11, primarily. And then uh, Dwight took that short study where we looked at Glenn's material. But before we begin this study, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for of the way that you work in our lives. We're thankful for this day, for another opportunity to get to know you and to open your word and to fellowship together and to receive strength for this day. We know, Lord, that um, we are children in understanding and you know all things. And we are so grateful that you've been able to share through your word and through providence and through the speaking of your Holy Spirit to our hearts, these things that we have found in Scripture, these hidden treasures that are precious to us and that have allowed us to rise above the darkness of this world into your marvelous light. And so we just again invite your Holy Spirit into our presence, into our hearts, to transform us, to cleanse us, make us new. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So what you see in front of you is a PowerPoint that we had drawn out. Well, this would be quite a long time ago uh, when we first started the study of understanding the lines that would have been in uh, 2022. I believe that was, was it March 21st or something? Anyway, we had started this study of understanding the lines, and in first going through that, we went through a reform line of uh, what, what we call the cosmic line. That is, um, and I don't have all of this here because this one is is leading down to uh, the history of the judges. Now, now we had, I changed a few things here. So uh, the way that I had this line. Uh, on the top, that that we're going to keep the same. So the reform line that we have is the seven days of creation. I probably should, I don't know. See, this was focusing on the judge's line. I probably should go to the other document because this doesn't have everything that I want in it. So I'm going to switch to this one. Sorry about that. I should have thought of that. Okay, so this is just a different PowerPoint uh, file. This one has all of my... PowerPoints on it, and I'm going to try to find, I don't know where it would be, you know, whether I had to look for it. Maybe I'll just type in cosmic line. Do it that way. Okay, there we go. Ah, yeah, so this is the one I wanted. Okay, so in this line here, you can see we have um, the first line at the top is the creation, the seven days of creation. You have, um, and in every line, we have a period of darkness, and that is, these are reform lines. God is going to uh, present a message that addresses the darkness. Now, the Bible starts out in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, right, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. There was evening and morning the first day, right? So in every reform line, there's a period of darkness. So this pattern comes from the creation of the world. And it's, of course, done in a symbolic sense. That is, the, the days of creation, though they're literal days of creation, they symbolize uh, God, uh, what he's going to do in the recreation of us as individuals. So when we looked at this line of creation, we could parallel the, this story with what happens in our lives as we come to know God. So we we all live in darkness, and God's light comes to us. And 
And I've shared this story many times regarding, you know, my personal conversion uh, on August 11th, 1980, that when I prayed to God and gave my heart over to him and asked him to take control of my life, the verse that came into my mind was the verse that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil, you know, and and relating to the idea that we 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 reject light, you know, because our deeds are evil, but that I could see that God's light was coming to me for really the first time that I was aware of it. So even though I had been, you know, studying, reading Christian books and studying my grandfather's and my father's, you know, theological library, just for me personally, understanding that this, that I was hiding from this light the whole time, that even in my Christianity, I was avoiding uh, you know, who I was, I mean, that to me was a revelation. That was light that came to me. So I'm just adjusting this arrow. They look the same. Um, so, so we can see that these days of creation uh, match in their symbols. And we're not going to go through the whole thing. The main thing that we want to see is that there are seven way marks. And, and there's always a first message, a second message, and then an arrival of a third message. And uh, that third message has associated with the num number seven. We can see that the Sabbath, of course, is the seventh day of the week. It's the seventh way mark. So in different reform lines, you're going to see uh, often the number seven is associated with the arrival of the third message. In, in a reform line, you also have a, a testing message that, that, that arrives at first and tests a group of people. Now here, obviously, there's no people. This is not a recreation. This is a the creation, right? And in in reform lines, we usually have a way mark called the time of the end. That's the first arrival of the first angel's message. Obviously, in the creation, it's the time of the beginning, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. So what we what we recognized is that these seven way marks can also uh, stretch the span from the creation of heaven and earth to the new heaven and earth uh, that's talked about in the book of Revelation and that the Bible describes what I entitled the cosmic line and that's just because of the cosmos right heaven and earth and all the things that God has created and in and there's these different way marks uh, that we can see. So we have the arrival of the first message. That's going to be the creation of heaven and earth and what God sets up there at the beginning. In every reform line, uh, there is an increase of knowledge. And uh, you're going to see in in this case, uh, it's knowledge. Sin is going to increase of knowledge of sin in the cosmic line. And then you have a flood, which is a formalization of the message. And then that message is empowered. Now, one of the things that we don't see here in this line quite clearly is that there are, are threads that run through these different lines. And one of those threads, I think the main thread, is that these lines uh, address uh, the promised seed, right? So the promised seed, of course, being Christ in the first gospel promise. I'm going to go there. Now, there are lots of different threads, but we're going to need to look at this one once we get into First Samuel, because that's really where we're going to be going. Maybe not today. We won't get there. We'll see. That's where we're going to get to. But in Genesis chapter three, we know Adam and Eve sin. And then, um, you know, they're not going to be able to recognize that they have sinned. They're not going to be able to confess their sins. You know, when God says you know, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. So Adam's just going to blame, blame Eve. But of course, he's blaming God, right? Because the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she, she, she's the one to blame, right? And then when God talks to Eve, she says, well, it's this serpent. He beguiled me and I did eat. So Adam and Eve are not able to confess their sins. They're not able to just see that they're sinners and confess their sins. 
because they haven't had a revelation of the gospel, right? So then God talks to the serpent. And he says, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above every cattle and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so we've, not just us, but commentators throughout the ages have recognized that this promised seed is Christ, and that the bruising of the head of the serpent and the bruising of the heel of the seed of the woman represents uh, uh, the cross, right? So we see that that happens at the cross. Now, we also know that, that there's these covenants that are made. This is, in a sense, a covenant, the everlasting covenant. The covenant is just an agreement uh, between two parties. And here God is making a promise of what he's going to do. And then there's conditions of this covenant. We see later that there's going to be a covenant made with Abraham. And, and Abraham's covenant also has a seed connected to it that is a descendant. But in Abraham's case, it's going to be all of these descendants. We know also when their uh, first son is born, that's Cain. Uh, Eve is going to take it that this is the promised seed, right? She doesn't, she doesn't see uh, the whole plan of salvation and all the history of the world in this. She's taking it in a much more local uh, and literal sense that she's going to have a child and that that child is going to bruise the head of the serpent. So, so this whole thread that goes throughout scripture of the seed, that is the whole story of the Bible is the story of the promised seed. That's the story of the gospel. And the reason why we have this chronology and this history of all these different people in scripture is that we have the line of Christ, how Christ ends up becoming the savior of the world, how he ends up addressing the issue of sin. And for some Christians, they focus just upon the cross. That's where they think it stops. Uh, but we know that the world didn't stop when Jesus died on the cross. We've still been around for, you know, 2,000 years. And um, so, uh, you know, so that is, is, is something that most Christians can't explain. But when we understand all of the symbolism of Scripture, the sanctuary, and the work that's being done by Christ, in the heavenly sanctuary, we can see that all of these types or all of these symbols are being fulfilled in Christ. But they all go back to this, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Okay, so so when we look again at, at this diagram, uh, it doesn't really show this thread. And there's probably ways that I could draw out this line. But what? But we can look at this line and see that there is this promised seed. And what happens at the flood that that would um, address that seed? Because in a sense, there is a reform line there also with the seed, because when we zoom into the way mark of the first angel arrives, we actually have a reform line addressing the fall of Adam and Eve and and so forth. Right. So we're not looking at that. We're just looking at the flood. And so how does the flood relate to the creation as a formalization of a message? So right now we have this silence going on that's going to be edited out um, so people won't realize I've, I've isn't given you... this yeah, isn't hey, this a formalization of God's judgment okay um, but we, we want to think about the seed so we're just gonna we're gonna because you can look at lots of different lines right with the, this cosmic line. But if we go back to the gospel promise and the seed, and, and we look at the flood, what does God do at the flood? Because remember, when we, we which, which I didn't state, which I should have when we were reading that, is that the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message Correct. that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. And so there's a group that's always going to be tested. Now, but there's a formalization of, of a message. So when we're addressing this story of the flood, what, what occurs at the flood? 
that illustrates the gospel that was message that was given in Genesis 3.15. Yeah, so there's judgment there, but what actually happens? Well, there's been a time of probation. Okay, yeah, so there there is actually an, um, a message connected to that. And, and it's a reform line, because we can look at the story of the flood. It's all a reform line. It's going to have a 120-year period uh, that that Noah has from when he's given the message to the time the flood comes. So he has that time to build the ark and to preach. And and not everybody in that period of time is lost, right? <clears throat> Some just die before the time of the flood. But Noah, his wife, and his three sons and their wives, the people on the ark, they'll be preserved. So what has been preserved, what has been formalized by the flood, if you think about this, of the covenant that was made in Genesis 3.15. You have, what, okay, Stephen. Go on. Yeah, you have two classes of worshippers being developed. Okay, yeah. And uh, that kind of, the seed of the woman, in a sense, is preserved in the flood. So the seed of the, the woman preserved in the flood, that's the point that, that I think is is important to see. Because there's all this sin, right? And God's going to destroy it. But he's He's going to destroy the world. And you can see how the flood is going to typify what happens at the end of the world when there's a new heaven and a new earth, right? Stephen, any more thoughts on that? Well, the, uh, the flood's uh, typifying the Sunday law, I think, at that time, as well as maybe the end of the thousand years as well. The, the, Destruction of the wicked. Okay. So, yeah. So we can see the flood. Now, if you look at this cosmic line, then, can you see the mirror? The creation of heaven and earth and the new heaven and earth at the end. The flood, right? And the Sunday law. We know that the symbol of the Sunday law is the flood in Scripture. Right? It's going to talk about this flood. Um. And then we have literal Israel and spiritual Israel, and the center here is the cross, right? So, so within this line itself, we can see that that there is this preserving of the seed, which is the formalization of this message. And then, how does literal Israel empower that message? The first, and we have first first angels' message. We use that symbolism from Miller, so from Millerite history even though these aren't technically angels' messages. So the first angel empowered, or the first message is empowered with literal Israel. How is that then empowered? Is it a, a connection with the sea and the land dividing, and then the division of the kingdom? Is that the way Mark is Israel then? Or? Well, well, okay, so literal Israel, we know that when we looked at that line of literal Israel, we zoom into it, we're going to see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right. Mm -hmm. And in, in that story of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, what's the main the main theme? Let's put it that way. The preservation of the seed. Yeah. So it's the preservation of the seed again. But here we're now going to actually get Israel. Jacob's name is going to be changed to Israel. Right. So there is there's this working out of this first promise that's leading to this covenant that's going to be made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So hopefully people can see that. I mean, there's a lot of detail that we're skipping over in just doing this review. But we can see here that there's this creation of heaven and earth, God's promises. But there's going to be, you know, this, this promised seed that's part of this. And this preservation of this seed. Now, when the second angel arrives at the cross, we now have the seed, right? We have Christ. That's where the seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head and the serpent will bruise his heel. But now we're going to have further history that continues. So, so what is the second angel's message in Millerite history? So this, of course, comes from Revelation chapter 14, the first, second, and third angel's messages. Uh, come out of Babylon. Okay. Oh, sorry, no. Well, it's actually Babylon has fallen. Babylon has fallen, right? Yeah. So it's not a call to come out of Babylon, 
right? Uh, because that's going to be the message of Revelation 18. The second angel is going to come again. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It's a doubling. And um, in Revelation 14, it doesn't have the call to come out of Babylon. Even though in Millerite history, they mixed Revelation 14 and 18 together, and they did make a call to come out of Babylon. But we know that that call to come out of Babylon, it occurs in the time of the Sunday law, right? So Babylon has fallen, right? That's the second angel's message. So how, how does spiritual Israel... Uh, how is that the formalization of the second angel's message in this cosmic line? So we know that's going to be the Christian church, right? And that, that comprises a huge amount of history, right? All the way from uh, the messages, well, the messages of the seven churches. Right? So that can maybe symbolize the uh, the seed that is of Abraham but by faith. Okay. Rather so, than by birth lineage. Right. So the contrast between the old and new covenant. So the old covenant was, uh, in a sense, a literal seed, right? Well, suppose there was an element where it was by faith as well, but. Uh... Oh, yeah, it was by faith as well. So we know that. But it still was, there was this literal seed, which is going to lead to Christ. And he's going to be the literal seed going all the way back to Adam even, right? Which we all do, but that line going through the kings of of Judah all the way uh, to Christ being born, being a son of David, right? So there's, so there's lots of different lines in here, but, you know, we sum up literal Israel in that whole history of literal Israel leading up to the cross. And then we have spiritual Israel that's from the cross where there's lots of, attached to the cross there. There's reform lines there as well. Right? So if we zoomed into the cross, we would see uh, reform lines. But, but the basic arrival of the cross is now we change from literal to spiritual. And so Abraham's seed being uh, those that are of faith, not the literal seed. Right? Because the, and that was the purpose of literal Israel was to spread the gospel to the world. God wasn't just choosing to save Jews. That wasn't the idea. They were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles or to the nations. So now we have spiritual Israel. We have the Gentiles have now received the, the promises of God. The blessings and curses apply to spiritual Israel. And we have the messages of the seven churches. Again, that's a reform line addressing spiritual Israel, which we're not going to go into. And there's lots of other lines in there. Right, because we have uh, in Revelation we have the seven seals, of seven trumpets, the seven churches. Each of these cover to some degree that history in different ways. Now, the one thing that we that we've we've talked about quite a bit, but that needs to be mentioned here again is in the promised seed. What's attached to the promised seed that we see uh, expanded upon? as we move through these lines. What's the characteristic that the promised seed has? What does what does what's the inheritance that's passed down? And how is it passed down? Well it's accompanied with uh, persecution. Well but just going back right from the beginning, we have this promised seed. What does that promised seed have attached to it? I mean obviously there's going to be persecution, the seed of the woman's going to be persecuted. But what are the characteristics? What's the inheritance involved, right? And how is it passed down, theoretically? What what's going to happen? Remember, it's going to be divided. Jacob, when he passes this down, it's going to be divided. So, what are these characteristics that we see when Jacob blesses his twelve sons? Well, at that time, it's going to be specified that it's going to be through Judah. Okay, so the kingship is through Judah, and then what are, what are the other two things? There's three things. That the promised seed inherits. Uh, prophet, priest, king, is that what you're thinking? Uh, well, there's the land, the double portion, right? And the priesthood. Yeah, the priesthood and the kingship, right? Does that make sense? So we, 
So, and it's normally the firstborn. So the firstborn technically is the one that's supposed to receive the double portion. Now, we see lots of times that uh, the firstborn doesn't receive it. Now, we know with Jacob and Esau, Esau is going to despise his birthright. He's going to sell it for, for some lentils, right? Um, and then Jacob is going to use some stealth uh, to receive the blessing from uh, from Isaac, right? But yeah. what he is receiving is he's receiving the kingship that is the head of the family, the priestly role, and also a double portion, right? That That's the idea. Now, when Jacob blesses his 12 sons, we're going to see the priesthood is given to the tribe of Levi, his son Levi, the kingship to Judah, and the double portion uh, to Joseph. Joseph's two sons each will receive uh, their own portion in the land, right? So when they get to the land of Israel, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, the two sons of Joseph, will, will be tribes. So now when Christ comes, he inherits that line. So how, how do we see that in Christ? Now, you mentioned prophet, priest, and king. So where do we see the double portion? What do we see when it comes to exactly uh, how's the prophet in there if it's not part of, of, of the double portion? So, so Christ is a promised seed. So how do we see this? Well, the Father has given all things unto his Son. Okay, so Christ inherits um, everything, right? Now, he's not going to take it all yet, right? So he's he's going to be a king, and he's going to be a priest, right? So even though he's the sacrifice, he's also going to be a high priest. He's going to, um, you know, go into heaven, and he's going to be ministering, you know, in a symbolic way in heaven, Right. He's not going to be taking his actual literal blood and sprinkling it in heaven on, you know, different uh, uh, vessels and so forth in heaven, right? Obviously, it's symbolic, not literal, but it's real. Just because something's symbolic doesn't mean it's not real. So Christ is really our high priest ministering in the heavenly sanctuary. And what he's doing on in heaven is reflecting what's happening on earth. So, so he has... Uh, but if we're going to say it as a double portion, how, how would we say that this is a double portion? Or, or do we apply the double portion, just that he gets everything? Definitely we can see his priesthood, and we can see that there's a kingship, but he doesn't receive the kingship yet. And does he receive the double portion then, is the question. Is that something that he receives later? So even though he's inherited this, Unless it's related to buying back uh, the people, mankind, there's that yeah. element in, in, in the sense restoring mm -hmm. him to have dominion over the earth again. Yeah. Uh, the element of uh, his government yeah. being established. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so we can see that, I mean, he's going to really receive his inheritance when there's a new heaven and a new earth. Like, because just because you, you, you're born and you receive, you know, you, you have the birthright, there still is a period of time in which you receive your inheritance, right? So, so he's going to receive his inheritance. Now, we could all say there's a double portion in a sense. Well, in the story of Job, Job is going to lose his family. Uh, but he's going to have another family, right? He's going to get all, all the children that died. They're going to, in a sense, be replaced. And so literal Israel is going to be placed, replaced with spiritual Israel. So you could kind of say that it's maybe a double portion. Well, he has a double portion of the animals. His livestock are doubled. Uh, of the what? His livestock is doubled. Oh, oh, yeah, his livestock is doubled in Job. Yeah. And as uh, some people think, his uh, the years that he lives is are also doubled. doubled. So they... Bit of speculation, but they think he lived 70 years until he had that affliction. And yeah. then he's going to receive another 140 years to live. Okay. 
And uh, in a sense, you're maybe saying that his family weren't lost originally, so they don't, they're not doubled. So in a sense, they're, they're in a sense, the original sons continue so he has like in a sense that they're not uh, it's not like the animals are doubled his children are in a sense preserved so they don't in a sense need to be just doubled so it's, that's the yeah, idea if you know what I mean yeah I understand what you're saying so some some of them in in the resurrection he'll have two the twice as yes. kids. yes so, yeah okay so we can see that this second angel's message, it, it has also the doubling attached to it, right? That's one of the points I wanted to bring out with the double portion. So, so you have this, this inheritance that he receives at the cross, which is a double portion. It's a doubling. And then, of course, we have the history of the church. Then we have the Sunday law. So the history of the church, spiritual Israel, that's the working out of this church, this new seed that he received. And then the Sunday law, where again, we have a testing message similar to the flood and two classes of worshipers are demonstrated. And then and then with the new heaven and the new earth that, that the second coming, there's, well, there's a lots attached to that. Obviously we just kind of group it all together, but we know there's lots of detail of the order of events from uh, the time when probation closes, the seven last plagues, a uh, thousand years, uh, the God's people are in heaven while Satan is bound to this earth. And then after that is the great white throne judgment. And then we get the new heaven and the new earth, right? So there's a reform line that we haven't really addressed yet in, in any kind of detail. So now when we, so we're still looking at this literal Israel reform line at this point in the period of the judges so when um let me see if i can find this here um so we did the period of the judges and then we're going to do um here i'll switch this screen i'll go back this way All right so when we looked at the judges line i don't want to look at the judges line i want to look at this line okay so now there it is literal israel um, so I have to share that screen somehow. It didn't seem to. Is it working? Yeah, it's working. Okay, I see it. Sorry about that. Looking at the wrong screen. So it's the second line here, literal Israel. And we can now I changed this when I originally had it. I didn't have judges there. Uh, but th I've, I've modified this line from what I had before. So we have Egypt to Canaan, and then we have the period of the judges. And then we have the period of the United Kingdom. And then we have the period of the divided kingdom and the three decrees. Now, as far as how this line has worked out in this reform line, we really haven't addressed it. We initially just put some things there. We didn't really go through this line yet. We just started Israel's 12 sons. So we went through, you know, this is literal Israel itself. And then we had... Um, Egypt to Canaan, Canaan had a reform line as well. That was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can see that line below there, right? So when we're dealing with literal Israel, it's it has different reform lines in it. And so the judges is one of the reform lines, okay? And after the judges, you have the United Kingdom. So the United Kingdom of Israel, you're going to have um, Saul, David, and Solomon, right? You're going to have three, right? Three different uh, steps. Now, prior to that, so this is where we're going to look at that, is that we have this story of Samuel. So we're going to go to the Bible here. So hopefully that review was enough. We, we'll come back to these lines again. And, and one of the things we will be doing is drawing these things on a line. So when we go to Samuel, the book of Samuel, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, these are uh, this history of uh, the kings of Israel and Judah. Um, but it's in going to be in Samuel that we're going to get the story of, of Saul, David and Solomon. 
uh, well, I guess Saul and David um, coming up to Saul. I can't remember exactly. It's it's not going to have all that history. Chronicles and Kings. Now, Chronicles is put together by Ezra from different books, some of those that don't exist, and also from the Book of Kings. So there is other books that existed at one time. Ezra is going to compile them into what we call First and Second Chronicles. Ezra also is going to write the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. But here, uh, the story of Samuel um, is obviously uh, an old, whoever wrote this exactly, we don't know who wrote the book of Samuel. The Bible doesn't tell us who wrote this, but it preserves this history. And it is a continuation of Judges, right? Did not Nehemiah write the book of Nehemiah? Did Nehemiah write Nehemiah? Possibly. Ezra is still alive in that time. So whether Nehemiah wrote Nehemiah or not, there's a dispute on that, whether Ezra just wrote it all. But he definitely wrote parts of Nehemiah, right? Because he's it's going to be in the first person. So, But the question is, who put these all together? Right. So anyway, Ezra definitely wrote Ezra, First and Second Chronicles, he compiled. Okay, but we don't know who wrote Samuel, right? Nobody talks about himself in Samuel. Okay, now, um, so, you know, we're, we skipped over the book of Ruth. So I guess we're being a bit ruthless in our study here, but we're, we're going to skip over it. There, there was a pun in there. but uh, So when we get to uh, uh, Samuel here, where is this? bringing us what history is this so there's i mean table history that stephen put together um is probably really necessary in in looking at this do you have some lines in there that we would be good at looking at um i'm just gonna bring this i think i'll bring this up do you know which page i should look (laughs) look at to go to samuel Okay. Um, yeah, probably just up a bit. Yeah, I'll just type in Samuel. So there's the judges. I don't want that. You mentioned Samuel quite a bit. So right there. Okay, yeah, I'm just going to zoom in a bit. Okay, yeah, so that's dealing with the judges, and then... But uh, Samuel is part of the judges. Yeah, he's part of the judges' history here. Yeah, yeah, because you're going to have... Uh, yeah, so it should be right after this. No, that's the United Kingdom. So where where is a good chart to look at? Because you're going to have uh, Eli. Yeah, have him there looking now. Yeah, here it is. I guess this is the chart that we would need. So so anybody studying uh, the Bible, I mean, this table of history is really good at putting uh, these different characters into their timeline. And it uh, takes a little bit of study to, to understand who everyone is. But we're going to have this period of these judges. So in this time, the judges, a lot of things are happening with uh, northern Israel, different parts of, 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 of the kingdom of Israel. They're having these different wars, different enemies coming in, and then judges delivering them. But it's going to be here where – so Eli – Now, when we did our Judges, we didn't really address Eli, right? Yeah, he's not in the book of Judges. Right, he's not in the book of Judges. Now, he's going to be in the book of Samuel, right? Yes. Um, So he's a judge, and um, now we say Samuel is a judge as well. So Eli, he begins to judge uh, 1227 B.C., and that's going to be, uh, you have a reference there, uh, 1 Samuel 4, verse 8. Right? So when we get there, we will see that we have Eli. And uh, that, that so, just tells you his age. He dies when he's, uh, it says he, he judged 40 years. I think that's what it says. But he dies yeah. when he's 98. So yeah. Yeah. in the final, so, he's, he's age 50 out there. Right. So he begins to judge in 1227, and then he dies in 1187, right? That's what you're saying? Or no, that's when the ark is moved to Shiloh. He dies then, right? 
Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. And then there's the 300 year prophecy that Ellen White uh, makes that uh, ends at that point as well. Yeah. Yeah. So from 300 years of Israel dwelling in Heshbon and Aurora. Right. So there's a lot of detail that um, obviously in the book of Judges to really understand this first part in Samuel. Now you're going to have when Ibzan and Elon, who are judges, die. Uh, Ibzan dies. So they're they're judging at the same time as Eli, right? That would be my best guess. It's a wee bit difficult, but uh, right. just going for the information I have, this is what I put together. Yeah. So some of these things we're not 100% certain on exactly how this works, but the idea is that Israel is not a united kingdom at this time. You have all of these different tribes, and different parts of Israel have judges over them. So they're not, all Israel is not united under a judge, right? A judge is somebody who comes and delivers them from a, an oppression of some of their enemies, right? And these enemies are the result. Why does, why does God allow all these enemies to come in? Because of apostasy. Right. So because of, of false worship and departing from God. And so he allows the enemies to come in and they turn to God. Right. We have similar things happen in our lives as well. Uh, and then what we're going to get is, um, you know, so in First Samuel chapter 7, verse 2 and 15, you're going to have Samuel becomes a judge. And that's going to be the end of Philistine oppression until the days of King Saul. And that Philistine oppression is the same Philistine oppression under which uh, Samson is a judge? I think so. Yeah, At least part of it, yes. Yeah, part of it, yeah. So this, yeah, and, and the Philistines coming from uh, the coast, right? So, so this would be generally oppression in uh, the western part of Israel. Yes. Yeah. And so a lot of times people don't, you know, I read the Bible for years. I went to university and I studied, you know, Old Testament, um, studied the kings and, and all this. I hardly understood any of it. And, and partly was, you know, there's no sort of practical connection to what has happened, right? So you, you're reading, you know, and I read, you know, Bible stories to my kids, Uncle Arthur's Bible storybook. Uh, you know, I've read the Conflict of the Ages series, which goes through all this history. And to me, it was all just kind of a blur, right? It's like, well, you got another king, you got another judge, you got, you know, like, who's who? I mean, I'm bad with names. I can hardly keep track of people that I know in, in, in real life, let alone somebody I've never met <laughs> in a book. But we've worked through a lot of this history. And when we study the Bible in the type of detail that we do, we're studying connections. And what I've found is that these, these stories come alive when we draw them on a line, when we spend time studying, and we understand that this history that has happened in the past is a type or an example, right? Pipos in Greek, all these things were written or aforetime were written as in samples, right? So these these types are things that represent our history, the time that we're living in presently. Now, when we went through the book of Judges, we saw that we made an application of Judges. So the thing about God's word is, um, is that it has many different levels to it. And we made an application that applied to this movement and to the things that were happening presently. It's not the only application that could be made in the book of Judges. But we could see that there was all kinds of symbols in the book of Judges that related to our movement. Um, and especially in, in connection with the symbolic use of numbers. So that would be something that would only be meaningful to us. But it doesn't mean that that's what the book of Judges is just about. There's other parts of the history of Judges that reflect what's happening in other ways, right? Now, when it so, but when it comes to Samuel and uh, 
you know, when we deal with the kings of Israel. Uh, there's definitely, we can always apply these things on a personal level. We'll probably see things, we haven't done this yet, so we don't know what we're going to find. But I'm sure we'll find things that parallel um, this movement. But I do think that we're going to find things that address a bigger picture in this world presently. Right. So with judges, a lot of times, well, I know Dwight always kept wanting to to go to like what was happening with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, where I was more focused upon what was happening with the movement, because I felt that that's where the, the focus was was. But it doesn't mean that that when he was applying it to the church, that that wasn't there. It was we could make these applications on a larger scale and also to the world. But I, I think here with uh, when we start going through Samuel, that we're going to find that there's a lot here applying to the church and to the events at the end of the world, right, that are on a bigger scale. That's my guess, right, um, based on past experiences and how we study these things. And, and I can sort of just thinking about some of these things um, you know, without a deep study, I can see how these different uh, elements connect. But there's obviously going to be lots that we're going to find. So one of the things that we're doing in the study is we're digging for hidden treasure, right? We're digging for things that were missed. And as we pass over the ground of fulfilled prophecy, we know that those events will reflect back on past events. So that is things that we go through now give us insight into the past and the understanding of those past events shines light forward onto our past on events or forward into the future. So the past shines light on the future, right? And that's what we're doing when we're studying here. So when we're studying this past, it's not just some intellectual exercise in what happened um, in the past in the Bible. We're actually trying to study and understand our present situation. And of course, that can be on a personal level. There's some things that would apply to us in our personal lives, within the movement, within the church, and within the world. Okay. So so when we look at this, this story of, of, of Samuel, that uh, um, this is a, a precursor to... This is the end of the period of the judges. And is the judges a period of darkness? Well, it has uh, elements of light and darkness within it. Right. So within every with, within every period, there's always reform lines, right? So obviously each of the judges is a reform line, so they have periods of light. But in an overall sense, can we see that the judges does represent a period of darkness? Comparatively, from when they were living godly in the land that was a descent gradually there was elements where there is like two steps down mm -hmm. one step up so gradually they're right making their way down yeah and 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 then uh, we're going to see that saul david and solomon represent the first second and third angels messages right that's what we expect to see that would be uh an application that we could consider, yes. Yeah, that, that would be, not that I like guessing, but in my, my, my educated guess is that we will see that they, these will fit. And what we look at is we look at the symbols that are attached, right? That there are, are symbols that repeat in every reform line. Now, we, we could also see within Saul himself, right, there's going to be a reform line of Saul. Now, Saul, in some ways, is going to be a failed reform line, which is kind of interesting. But David also is, in some ways, a failed reform line, as is Solomon, right? And, and that's the thing that I find interesting about this kingdom, because that reform line, you know, the, you have a period of darkness in the simple sense. You have a first angel's message arrive. Saul, but that these all tend to be failures. And why would this line of the kings, the United Kingdom of, of Israel, why would it be, why would it have this failure attached to it? 
I mean, I know I'm looking way ahead here, but did God intend his people to have a king? No, but he no? foresaw, no. He foresaw yeah. its, uh, its potential. Right, because it, it's not his original design. Uh, McDonald, do you have a comment on that? Yes, I wanted to say uh, God did not intend uh, for them to have a king because they had already a king who is uh, Christ himself. Right, so so Christ is our king. So so even though these are reform lines, one of the things we recognize in these reform lines is that God, he has this bigger reform line in, in, in mind, right? Often I, I have atheists who, you know, question the Bible because God is acting in such a, um, an unethical way, right? And, you know, why doesn't God do things differently? If God is, is God of love, why does sin and suffering happen? Why do three-year-old children get bone cancer? Um, you know, those types of questions. Unethical and, uh, or capricious? What's that? Unethical or capricious? Yeah, capricious. Yeah. And define capricious for us? I've always treated it as a, a word where one is acting without compassion. Yeah, and arbitrarily. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, but but we see that God actually has a purpose in all of these things that is happening is he's trying to restore us to his image. And if he was to intervene in the way that atheists think he should, could man ever be restored to God's image? No. No. So, so God is love and love brings children into the world who are going to suffer. Right. I have seven children. I, I was very cognizant of the fact that life is painful and that my children could suffer. And yet it was an act of love to bring them into the world. Right. I wasn't being capricious. <laughs> right. Or cruel, you know, and having children. Though there are people who think that you are. But, you know, they're alive. I don't know if they would be happy if their parents never had children. But uh, so we can see that God has these purposes and he allows Israel to have a king. He allows us to take over control of our lives and make a mess of things. But in that, his purposes are worked out because his ultimate purpose is to bring us into harmony with him, to transform our characters. And so he has allowed a lot of things to happen to us that we could, if we weren't enlightened by God's spirit, uh, be angry at God about, right? And a lot of atheists are angry at God. They try to claim, well, they don't believe in God. How can they be angry at him? But they're sure pretty angry at somebody that doesn't exist, you know, which would be kind of foolish. And I mean, I know atheists very angry at God. They're atheists, but they're angry at God. They need to kind of consider that. And they, they can say they're not, but it's pretty clear that they are and that they're trying to do as much damage as they can. So uh, to get back at God for what's the, the lot, the hand that's been dealt to them, however you want to look at it. So so we can see that, that there's something about this reform line of the kings uh, that God is illustrating. So we need to understand what he's illustrating in in. Um, this gospel. So this United Kingdom of Israel, uh, which is going to be the second angel's message arriving, it is it it is that one that parallels with the cross, right? That is, it lines up with the cross. And so there's there's lots of connections. And 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 I know it's gonna it's gonna be an interesting study. I don't know how long it's gonna get take us to get through first and second Samuel whether we will ever get through them. But we're definitely going to learn a lot of things about scripture, about prophecy, and about ourselves. And um, and that's the whole purpose of these studies. Probably be as long as Daniel 11. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the thing is, all these other things that we studied, I mean, I, I believe in God's providence that he has allowed us to go through this um, in this process, because my original plan was after Judges, we would just go right into Samuel. But we, we took, uh, you know, a year and uh, a 
couple of months uh, to go through uh, Daniel's last vision at the request of, of Colin. And um, I think it's good that we did, but this, but there's, there's, I mean, it was extremely timely, but in some ways, you know, I, I wish that we hadn't <laughs> uh, just because there is a continuity that happens from judges into, into uh, the Kings that it's going to take us a little bit to get our feet back on solid ground again in understanding exactly how we're doing things. But there are things we learned from Daniel that will help us quite a bit. So we, we've, we have a few more analytical tools at our disposal uh, that should help us. And uh, we're going to try to be meticulous. We're going to deal with minutia, which, uh, you know, sometimes people can feel that we get a little bit bogged down. But every time when I've done study and I've, I've spent like sometimes, you know, a few weeks dealing with some little point, it is always very rewarding once you have that breakthrough. And, and so that I expect that God's going to be leading in this study in, in lots of ways that are unexpected. Okay, so we're going to start reading. Now, uh, Dwight, you're going to do you have a document where you put together any like the first chapter of Samuel or anything yet? Or are you going to you going to have time to do that or check your email? Oh, so you already sent me something? Ah, oh, there it is. Okay, good. Okay. Now, second Samuel, or the, the second chapter is taking a bit, but the first chapter, I've done what I can. Okay. Yeah, well, thank you for that. So what we have here is, uh, you should be able to see that now, right? Right. You might want to bring it up a little larger. I'm going to do this differently, just going to do this the right way. This is the first studies on Samuel, right? Yeah. Yeah, I got to I got to download the file there. Open it up. Yeah, this is the first studies on Samuel. There we go. That's better. Uh, it could be a little bigger. Yeah, I'm going to make it bigger. Just got to get all this stuff set up. Okay. So so this is um when you put your notes together, these headings, these come from uh, the 1769 King James summary or headings. Right. Yeah. So it just gives this sort of overview. Elkanah, a Levite, hath two wives. He goeth yearly to worship at Shiloh. He favoreth Hannah and comfort, comforteth her when insulted on account of her barrenness at, by Penaniah. Hannah, in grief, prayeth for a child and voweth to give him unto the Lord. Eli, mistaking at first, rebuketh, but afterward blesseth her. God remembereth Hannah, she beareth Samuel, and stayeth at home till he is weaned, and she presenteth him to the Lord according to her vow. Right. So then we're going to have some. So there's going to be some spirit of prophecy quotes here. Correct. In the first and second chapters of 1 Samuel is recorded the prayer of a consecrated woman who served and glorified God. Her offering of thanksgiving for the answer of her prayer is a lesson to those who today receive answers to their requests. Do we not neglect to return praise and thanksgiving to God for his loving kindness? So um, so in here, I'm just seeing. Yeah. So you have these quotes here first before we get to the first verse, right? Correct, because this this gives us a overview, uh, an overview. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, it helps us put it in context here. So God's goodness in hearing and answering prayer places us under a heavy obligation to express our thanksgiving for the favors bestowed on us. We should praise God much more than we do. The blessings received in answer to prayer should be promptly acknowledged. The record of them should be placed in our diary, that when we take the book in hand, we may remember the goodness of the Lord and praise his holy name. Um, that's something that Heidi always does. You know, she'll pray over the littlest things, and then she always uh, thanks God right away and, uh, and, and notes it. Now, of course, I never write anything down, so uh, I don't have a diary. Uh, but I do try to keep things in my mind. 
and remind myself of God's goodness and his answers to our prayers. David declares, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. It is for our present happiness and future good that God subjects us to discipline. With patient tenderness, Christ guides the newborn soul into his kingdom as a mother teaches her little child to walk. Now, this of uh, this, I really like this, that sentence there. Now, when we think about our own personal experience, uh, when we came to God, did we come with a full knowledge of everything that we were doing, of what God's purposes were, you know, how things were going to turn out? No, came by faith. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and and sometimes when we look at other people who are coming to know God, you know, it, it can be worrisome. You think, how are they going to to get through this mess that we got through? Right? But we got through it. And so any sincere soul who is looking to follow God, God will guide them. Just like a mother teaches her little child to walk. And so the advice I always give people who, like I have a guitar student who's, you know, looking to become a Christian, uh, you know, he's studying now. He's, I think he's 14 or 15. He's young. You know, and he's got to sort through all of this information that exists, you know. Now, he goes to the, the a Catholic school. He's not Catholic. You know, his parents aren't religious at all. And, uh, you know, he, he plays guitar, so he plays guitar at mass. So he's, he's exposing himself to lots of different things that he's going to have to sort through. But I know that if he's wanting to follow God, God will lead him. Doesn't mean that I don't, you know, try to give him some information here and there. But I have no control over what decisions he makes. He's the one who's in control. Every one of us has to, in a sense, go through this journey alone as far as other people are concerned. Because there is no one that we can trust other than God. And what is our, our natural tendency that God has to uh, address? What is, what is the, the natural tendency that is counterproductive to coming to know God? Well, there's those things that can be the things of the world, influences, the friends, yeah, just false teachings and suffering. Yeah, and, and we tend to trust man. We tend to look to someone other than God, right? Yes. And we see this with ancient Israel, right? They, you know, that's why they wanted a king. Right. And, and, and we see people, you know, they follow man. And, you know, there is no man that can guide you. There's only God that can guide you. Now, there are people that you can, you know, fellowship with and, and be a part of. Right. Nothing wrong with belonging to church. It's actually really necessary in order to see things in ourselves that need to change, to learn how to love other people. Right? All these things are really, really important. But but it's God that we go to each day to guide us, not to man. And and we saw in this movement when Parminder and Tess split off from the movement, took the vast majority of the movement with them. You know, Parminder was basically saying, you can't understand God's word for yourself. You have to trust the leadership. Right? It basically became a cult. And, and most religions... You know, even ones that talk about all these evil cults, most of them are really just cults themselves. That is, they put man in the place of God. And we believe, as Seventh-day Adventists, that in the priesthood of all believers, that there is, that the sole authority is not a creed, not a church, but is God's word. That's, that's the standard in which we understand all things. And, and none of us have the ability or the power to, you know, to to condemn another to hell. Right? We can't, you know, we, we could disfellowship people, right? 
I mean, the church has the ability to do that, but that's not going to uh, change that person's salvational status, right? That person is really accountable to God. So if a church disfellowships you, it doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. So, so we always need to remember this, that, that it's, we have the ability to come to Christ ourselves and we don't have some man as a mediator. Christ is our mediator. Okay. Through thank, sanctification, the heart becomes more and more like the heart of God and the will is more fully conformed to the will of God. Now, what is sanctification here? What she's talking about, because it's a, a technical term sometimes. People just, we throw these words around sanctification. Isn't it the second step in our relationship with Christ and the Father? Okay, so we have a term justification. When we come to Christ and we ask him to forgive us, um, we are justified. That is, we are are made righteous. Our sins are forgiven. Christ loves us. He treats us as though we've not, we've never sinned, right? Sanctification is the daily process of justification, right? That is, we come to God every day just as we first came to him as erring, helpless, condemned sinners, right? We don't become a Christian and look at ourselves as good because we have this work of sanctification. The more we know God, the more we see our deformities. But in that process, it says the will is more and more fully conformed to the will of God. Right. So there's sort of this um, almost a contradiction in some ways, because as we are more and more fully conforming to the will of God, we see more and more our deformity, our lack of, of the, the, the contrast between us and God in character. You would think the more we fully conform to the will of God, the more we'll see ourselves as godly, right? Wouldn't that naturally be how you would think things would be? But it's not that way. Right. So it is time that those who claim to believe the truth understood that their lives, their thoughts, words, and deeds testify to the value of their religion. Now, <clears throat> before you before you go on from there. Yeah. Um now this this has a lot to do with with my love of minutia. <laughs> I had I was remiss. This is a, a non published document. I did not note it as so, but I also have noted that this manuscript one five eight is something that gives us another point right back to both the 1843 and the 1850 charts. Yeah. So we know 158 on the 1843 and the 1850 charts, the year. And yeah. the the situation of 158 is a symbol of a a relationship in some ways it is a symbol of a relationship, a league that we should not enter into. But here, everything is being shown of what it is to enter into a relationship that we should enter into. Yeah. So we know 158 BC, that's the league between the Jews and the Romans. Correct. League. And uh, 666 years later, we're going to have um, the taking away of the daily. Right. Right. And, and of course, that that league is it's well, we have all these lines of prophecy that, that tie up to that date. The thirteen hundred and thirty five years from the first league that the Jews made. And then there's thirteen thirty five years from five thirty eight or five oh eight to um, eighteen forty three. Right. So to the end of 1843 to April 19th, 1844, when the second angel's message arrives. So lots of, lots of symbolism. It's also August 15th, the 15th of August, which is the midnight cry in Millerite history. So a bunch of symbols there, but yeah. So we're not, we're not going to get a chance to really go through today to go through these, but um, 
uh, what I suggest people do is kind of take a quick read through 1 Samuel chapter 1 before the study tomorrow. But it says, now there was a certain man of Ramoth Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Okana, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephrathite, right? Now, one of the things that we're going to do, so um, there are some tools that we will be using. And I'm going to do it this way, just hang on. So one of the tools is, so this is a, and I'm just going to put the link here. So it's at palmonai.org forward slash kingjv forward slash. So you can see that up in the corner. So palmonai.org, that site has the Bible indexer. It also has uh, the calendar convert, as well as other charts and links to papers and, and so forth. But the reason why we use this, uh, we also use, of course, ESORD, because we look at the Hebrew numbers. But we can look at a verse and we can look at, uh, so when you see when I click on 1 Samuel 1, verse 1, you're going to see that it's going to say it's the reverse verse that is in that chapter. Um, it's the Bible verse number 7,214, the reverse Bible verse 23,889, the book verse 1, right, so first reverse book verse 810, the lexical sum, that's all of the strong numbers uh, for the Strong's Dictionary for each of the words in that verse, 54,381, it's the ninth book of the Bible, it's the Reversed book number from counting from Revelation backwards is 58th, right? So so we use some of these tools um, to uh, because symbols show up. Now with, um, and I'll go here then. You download this indexer from online somewhere? Yeah, palmonai.org. Okay. Yeah, if you go to palmonai.org, palmonai.org, you'll find the calendar converter, you'll find the indexer and other things, articles as well. Now then, obviously in the King James, uh, uh, which we usually use the King James Plus, but you could use other translations if you really wanted to. That On my eSword, I have, I don't know, lots and lots of different translations, different languages. Um, but you can see here, we have the Strong's numbers. And so these symbols, these numbers attached to these, we, we often can see that we can relate them uh, to symbols of scripture, prophecies, and so forth. Uh, spans of time, we've used it as, so that number can represent a period of days. How we're going to, what we're going to find, we have no idea how God's going to open up the book of Samuel. Right. So God may open it up in ways that we have never anticipated. And um, but that's what we're praying for. That's why we're studying. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what we will find. So any final thoughts before we close with prayer? And I do appreciate you putting together those notes there, Dwight, as well. OK, well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful, Lord, for this day, this um, the last day of September and uh, the opportunity we have in this new study. We just pray for one another. You know, Lord, that um, the work that you have begun in us, that you are going to complete it into the day of Jesus Christ. And so we ask that we can participate with you in that work and that we will not hinder the work you want to do in our lives. Bless each person. May your angels watch over them. May your Holy Spirit speak to us and strengthen us by your grace. Bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.